in the spirit of Dazer, I did want to talk a little bit about the issues in science and technology, and there are copies outside where that you can pick up. Um, this is the quarterly policy journal of the National Academy of Sciences, and what I think is most distinctive about it, if, especially if you look at it compared to other science magazines or other public policy magazines, is that um, the work of artists is featured prominently in every issue. Typically three, four, even five artists are featured. And this is where I work with JD and Alana. And often in a magazine like this, you know, in a magazine like the New Yorker or the Atlantic um, or Harper's, um, art is used to, to decorate the articles. The magazines are really about text and words and so on. But that's not the case at all. If you look at issues, you'll see that we use art the same way that we use the feature written articles. We think that what artists have to say, the way they present reality, the way they um, use their imaginations, the way they force us to, to look differently, to think differently, to hear differently, is really important to understanding how people think, how they make decisions, how they form their values. So a lot of the work that we do here at the National Academy of Sciences is, is of course, wonky, rigorous, logical, um, evidence-based analysis of subjects. And that is, in fact, very important and it's essential. We should know that type of stuff when we are making decisions that have um, large implications for the planet and for the people and other beings that live here. But I think it's a mistake to think that that perspective alone is enough to guide us to make good public policy. And even if we get the analysis right, having the analysis right is not enough to convince people that that's the right thing to do. And also, I think for scientists, it's important for them to understand that their way of viewing, slicing, and cutting the world is not the only way of doing it. And so part of what we try to do in the magazine is to mix these various perspectives. So the article, the art that's in the magazine, some of it we use in some sections, we just use artists because we like their work. So in the next issue, for instance, um, we will have some wonderful photographs of whales next to an article about whale protection. But in our letters section, we'll, we have a group of photographs of some sculpture that was placed underwater and then over time, life, grew on this sculpture and it sort of changes it and evolves and you just see how the, the ocean is interacting with the, the material, the artwork that we've placed on the ocean floor. So it's, you just think about it, well, it's interesting and we interact, we don't just study nature, we don't just study the physical world, we also learn from it, we act, react from it. It imposes itself on us. So all of this, I think, goes into our thinking. I also think that um, in one of the, the failures of science, the difficulties of science, is for it to understand other value systems and other ways of seeing. And as a result, um, you know, if you think in only one way or you have only one lens for viewing, you wind up missing a lot of the side. You're looking straight ahead all the time. You have no peripheral vision. And I think what other disciplines, include the arts, the humanities, um, the social sciences, all allowed us to create that type of peripheral vision. And if we pay attention to all of them, we'll have 360 degree vision and maybe from that some wisdom and some policy that will actually um, serve us well. So that's my general thing and I think that's part of the spirit of Dazer. I mean we talk about it as art and science but it's, it's really art, it's science, it's culture and I think it's also you know, civic values and public policy. We are in Washington. We're, this is the ocean in which we swim which is public policy and we often don't think about it. But all of the things people are doing, and this is the scientists and the artists as well, really all of those things are contributing to the whole fabric by which we make public policy, decide the type of world we want to live in, and do the things we need to do to make that world better. So um, with that in mind, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about water. Um, tomorrow is World Water Day. It's actually technically tomorrow, but events have started today. Um, I actually spent the afternoon over at the American Association for the Advancement of Science listening to the director of the International Institute for Advanced Systems Analysis, um, the head of the World Bank program on water, talking in very scientific wonky ways about 
the issues that we face. And, um, and some of them are real, um, and we need to know about them. We need to know that between 1940 and 2010, world water use increased tenfold. And um, so from 500 cubic kilometers to 45, almost 5,000 cubic kilometers. Um, we need to know that there are a billion people in the world that don't have access to fresh drinking water. Um, we need to know that you know, more than a billion people live in, world, and live in areas where the, the uh, climate is so dry that agriculture is not possible. And um, also that there are any number of issues um, when they did some surveys of world leaders, and when they asked them, they recognized, you know, you know do you, what are the things you worry about? Do you worry about hazards? Do you worry about terrorism? Do you worry about climate change? Do you worry about hunger? And those things are all there. But I think what they often don't think about, and this is what the person from the World Bank said, is that all of these things are dependent on water. I mean, when you look at climate, it depends to a certain extent on what we know about clouds, one of the forms of water. It also depends on water exists and how much reaches the planet, because that determines how much grows there. And then when you know how much grows there, you know how much absorption we have of carbon. If you're looking at hunger, you're obviously talking about agriculture. And the limiting factor in agriculture in most of the world is the water supply. Um, in the United States, we use almost 70% of our water goes to irrigating agriculture. So as much as the rest of us might try to do about shortening our showers and using low flush toilets and everything, um, two or three farmers can wipe that out in a couple of seconds. Um, so when we're thinking about this, we do have to be aware of those things. Um, and for that reason, it's interesting that I did um, for a while actually work um, for Jacques Cousteau. Um, I was a writer, not um, a diver. Um, I did not go out on the Calypso. Um, I was one of the principal writers for an almanac of the environment. And some of you are old enough to remember Jacques Cousteau and, and his television show and his movies, but in, he was one of the people that understood that the science of the oceans and what we were learning about the oceans was not really getting out to people. And I think as Halley pointed out, that cartoon in The New Yorker, I don't really care, Jacques Cousteau was one of the people that made people care about what was happening beneath the surface of the ocean and enabled them to see what was happening. Um, and one of the little known things about him, I think, is that he actually invented the Aqualon. So it was as an inventor, the technology made it possible for him to get underwater, and that made, inspired him to say that, boy, everybody should see this. Not everybody's going to become a diver. Let's also work with others to develop the technology so that we can film underwater and, and reveal this world to people. Um, so he did that, he popularized that. A lot of scientists didn't like him because sometimes the science was wrong. And um, people would say, well, you know, that's, that's, you know, what's he doing? He's putting out misinformation. And so I think what he was doing was putting out wonder and amazement and curiosity that would inspire people to become scientists and to try to answer these questions. And I thought that was a terrific service and actually made an enormous contribution to science because that once that happened, people wanted to fund the research, people wanted to do this exploration, more people wanted to get under the surface of the ocean. And for that reason, he decided also that he wouldn't just focus on water. He saw water connected to all environmental issues. And he decided that we should put out this almanac of the environment. And, um, and I'll tell you two little things about Jacques Cousteau that are important. One is that in most American offices, your employer provides free coffee to keep you working. At the Cousteau Society, the wine was free at lunchtime <laughs> because they were French and they know how to live. Um, the other thing, and this was our little joke on Cousteau, all the time we were working on this book, he, was off, he would you know, go off on the Calypso for a while and he'd come back to New York and we'd have meetings, we'd talk about him. Um, throughout the work on the book, he was convinced that there was a chapter on sex and the environment. Be also because he was in French and he thought that would be great. There was no chapter on that. But Jacques Cousteau was open to the idea that you need to connect environmental issues, scientific issues, whatever they are, to every part of people's lives. And he, he did believe. Now, we couldn't figure out exactly how to connect sex and the environment. But Cousteau was convinced there probably was a connection and it was worth exploring. And, um, and I think that that's one of the ways that I think this group and the other um, panelists are here are, are thinking is that there are so many entry, entry points into understanding science and using science also to open up worlds of art and the imagination. So um, with that, I'm going to 
pass the baton. Thanks, Kevin.